What were the events that led to that first Mardi Gras in 1978? As far as I understand, it was the, the Stonewall riots that brought it about, the idea of having a Mardi Gras here. Um, again, as far as I remember, at a camp executive meeting, Ron Austin came with the idea of having a, I don't know if he called it a Mardi Gras at the time, but like a street party and to have it where gays would congregate. And in those days it was Oxford Street. I mean, the place was filled with bars and nightclubs and all the corruption that went on with the police and all that. Um, for them to exist, that is. Um, so that idea was taken up and I think Margaret McMahon or the two of them might have talked about it, I don't know. And it was in June, wasn't it? Not in February or March? No, no, no. As it, it is was, these days. It was to coincide with the celebration of the Stonewall Rides, which I understand. I think it was the ninth anniversary and I think it was the day of International Dale's Gay Solidarity. Right, right. And so how did you both get involved with it? Well, both being involved in camp, how else could we not get involved? <laughs> um, you know, any kind of demo, and there were lots of those in the streets in those days, to the, around uh, St Andrew's Cathedral, the town halls through George Street, lots of demos. And I think on that and day, that, in particular, yeah, there had yeah. been a protest in the morning, then there was a meeting at Paddington Town Hall, I think, and then in the evening, at around 10, 10.30, that's when the parade took place. I, I have no recollection of the meeting at the town hall. My recollection starts at Taylor Square, a group of people, I don't know, a couple of hundred maybe, gathering there and having a permit, to, uh, a police had given us a permit to go down Oxford Street to what's now called Whitlam Square just near Hyde Park. That's where we were to disperse. And when you were in Taylor Square, what was the atmosphere like? I suppose it was exciting because we, I don't know, we just loved it to be on the street and to demonstrate and to, to be out and open and say, you know, we're gay. It's nothing to be ashamed about. <laughs> yes, it was great. I, I really enjoyed that. Yes. And, uh, we, we did cheat a little bit later when the uh, rioting was taking place in Darlinghurst Road. Um, <clears throat> there were uh, oh, paddy wagons everywhere and, and almost as many police as there were <clears throat> demonstrators. <clears throat> not a single number or name on any police uniform, not one. And <clears throat> Peter and I were to leave the next morning on our first holiday for five years. We were flying to Cairns to stay with a friend there, so we didn't particularly want to get arrested that night. So I must admit we we used electric light poles and things. And garbage bins. And garbage bins to hide behind. But I seem to remember, so you left Taylor Square. Yes. And... Was there floats as there are nowadays, or was it one float at the beginning? Just one truck, an open, open top, do you call it? Open, open top, top truck. yes. Lance Garland, he was the, the driver of the truck. Uh, there might have been some decoration on the truck, but nowhere near as glamorous or as mm -hmm. out <laughs> over the top as it is And now. as you were going down Oxford Street, people started to join the parade. Yes. Because some of you were going into bars. And what were you chanting? Uh, out of the bars, into the street. Of course, you know, too many people, the bar was the only place where they could meet other people. And they would, you know, it was like a, like a small ghetto. And I suppose those places still are. Anyway, so as we came down from Taylor Square, our contingent grew. I don't, I can't remember by how many, but it was more when we were at Whitlam Square. And then decision was made, well, this is good, let's go on. 
bugger the police and we'll do as we like these streets are ours <laughs> am i correct in thinking that the, the police had tried to stop the parade around hyde park well the, there would have been police there because that was the end of the permit we weren't really permitted to go any further i think we would we were allowed to disperse into hyde park but the decision was made, we go on. So we turned into College Street. And well, we were in College Street. We, we turned right at Wicklips Square. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, and we uh, stopped okay. in the beginning so of College, College Street. So College Street is just right of Oxford Street. On the right, yes. yes. So we continued on and then, I don't know who made the decision to go up to William, up William Street and go to the cross. So you went down Darlinghurst Road? No. Towards the fountain? Yes, we yeah. went College Street, yes. turned right into William Street. William Street, all the way up, which, you know, it goes mm -hmm. up. Then we got to Darlinghurst Road, yes. is that what it's called? That's we right. turned left, and of course the police realised, had realised already, they blocked had a big contingent as we arrived at the El Alamein fountain or near there they had a huge contingent already blocking it off so we couldn't go any further and as soon as we were in so so to say they closed it off at the other end so we couldn't get out so were you all trapped basically yes mm -hmm. and what were the police doing exactly well they were belting people up they were, you know, dragging people into paddy wagons. It was just horrific, William. It was like, like a riot. Well, it was a riot. It was a riot. I mean, mm. they had, what do you call those things? The batons? The batons. They mm. were belting people with that. And was there any blood? That I can't remember. But it was just a horrific scene. And paddy wagons, other... Dem other people who came in the parade, you know, rocking the paddy wagons and trying to open the door and then the police would come and belt these people up and arrest them. And How did you feel? Were you scared? Yes, mm -hmm. very scared. Were you at at attacked or assaulted? No, we weren't because as Bonner's explained, we, we hid ourselves, but we saw it all happening. But and I neither of you were arrested, were you? No. No. The Robin placed her, the uh, woman we mentioned to you before, uh, <clears throat> who was a maths master at, at uh, MLC Pimble, PLC Pimble, one of those <clears throat> church schools. Uh, <clears throat> she was arrested. Uh, <laughs> she was they opened the back door of the paddy wagon, tried to shove her in, all the gays inside tried to push her out. And I have this glorious memory of Robin who was wearing a beautiful white Persian lamb coat, because it was quite cold oh, yes. in the middle of June, <laughs> of Robin being shoved out of, out of the paddy wagon at the back and finishing up underneath crawling out of the side <laughs> from under the paddy wagon and uh, then of course uh, not to her benefit or to anyone's benefit the dear Sydney Morning Herald of course published the names of everybody who'd been arrested but uh, I think she kept her job didn't yes, she? she did. Mm. Yeah. Mm. No, the you ask what it felt like it was such an anti-climax William Mm. You know, there was great joy, great sense of liberation, the old-fashioned word, um, you know, of all these people getting together and marching for the same thing. And, well, some just for fun, others for political motives, whatever. Um, you know, there was this sense of, a sense of joyful community until we got to that near the El Alamein fountain. And the whole atmosphere, everything changed. It was just horrific and totally unnecessary. It was something the police wanted to show. We are the boss. And of course, um, 
homosexuality and sex between two men hadn't been decriminalised at that point no, no, in no. New South Wales. That's 83 it became, it, it was decriminalised. Do you think the events at that first Mardi Gras parade partly led to that decriminalisation? I don't think so. I think it was more hard work by some other people, including Lex Watson, who who played a you know a major role in, in in bringing it about, and of course other people. It's you know it's never one person. It's always a group of people. But he was the the what can I say the main person in that group who who actually brought it about. But just to go uh, to go back a little bit because after those horrific attacks, the riots, then of course lots of people were arrested, taken to the dreadful Darlinghurst police station, which of course already was quite notorious for being corrupt, getting, you know, lots of money, making money from the gay bars <laughs> just in Oxford Street. And Almost like a protection racket. Oh yes, I mean the, the, the bars and the police, yes that was. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, I think the, the actual riot was more of a, you know, showing we have the power, we can stop you wherever we want to, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but, so there were quite a lot of people arrested, so lots of people who weren't arrested all went to Darlinghurst police station and stood outside for hours chanting, you know, release them now or whatever the chant was. There probably would have been a few of different ones. There was also uh, immediately started a, a collection, money collected for bail so that all the people could be bailed out instead of having to stay in the cells overnight. Terry Goulden was the main person, as far as I remember, who, you know, who collected the money and people, you know, gave generously because we realised how horrible it is to be in those policemen's hands. Dreadful. So... Couldn't we hear Peter Murphy from well, the street? I, th I think we did, but I'm not too sure. Because Peter, Peter Murphy, Murphy was beaten up quite badly, badly, wasn't he? Yes, very yes. badly, yes. And there was a, <clears throat> a young graduate doctor, Jim Walker, who was part mm -hmm. of the demonstration. Again, a very committed person, you know, to liberation. And of course, he gained permission to go into the police station, as far as I understand. I mean, there were no no lawyers as far as I knew, but he was able to go in and to uh, have a look at Peter Murphy who was very badly beaten up, as he will probably, if you speak to him or have, he will testify. Had the that. police ever apologised officially? No. Apparently there is, <coughs> there is some move now, some 78ers as we are, we are called, those who were in the first Mardi Gras, uh, have made contact with some parliamentarians who seem, and I think it's a multi-party group of people who are very sympathetic towards getting an apology, uh, but I don't know how, far, how much further that has gone. Are you optimistic it will be forthcoming? I think it will. Um, I'm, I'm in two minds about apologies. Yes, I know it's a recognition of what, what they've done wrong. I suppose that's what it will say. You know, it was unjustified, hopefully. Um, but I'm more interested in what's happening today. Does that really change their attitudes, their behaviours towards our community? from now and from now on. Do you both think that their attitudes, that's the police attitude, has changed? Oh yes. Yes, I'll take it drastically. For the better? Oh yes, yes. Every Mardi Gras parade, I, <clears throat> I go to the uh, group of police who are part of the parade and say to them, 
so nice to see your numbers and your names on the uniform. <laughs> and they say, yeah, yeah, we didn't have them in 78. <laughs> okay. I mean, there will always be pockets of, might it be police, might it be wherever, pockets of, or groups of people who will oppose, you know, who will not accept for what we are. We're just human beings. Uh, we just happen to be attracted to our same sex. How, how do you feel when you see the police marching? I still, I don't know, I still, I'm too mind, I've, I'm in two minds about it. It's wonderful that's happened and that there's been, you know, that, that huge improvement in relations between our, our community and, and the police. I don't know, there is still a bit of, I don't know if it's anger, William, or if it is, I don't know. There's still something. I'm not 100% joyous to say, wow. Is there anything that could change that feeling of anger that the police or the government could do? It would be really nice to actually meet some of those, if they're still alive, some of those police officers and have instead of the, the, uh, the apology that might come to have like a, a meeting with them and for us to tell them what it felt like to be beaten up you probably to have them been. instead of you know this general apology you probably have to Pushed them there in their wheelchairs. Well, no, well, I'm still around. <laughs> no. Yes, but you were getting nice and young then. I'll do that. There were, some young, <laughs> there were some young police officers there. They weren't all old. Anyway, oh, no, no, no. I think that that would take away that final bit of, you know, for them to say, I'm really sorry what I did to you people. What do you think is the greatest legacy of that first 1978 Mardi Gras parade? Uh, I think I would describe it as a galvanising event of for the future, not necessarily at that moment. I think there was still some division even then within the community, although it was smaller then. Um, a galvanising for the future that you know, when we look back, starting or being part of camp foundation members in, in the early 70s, if we now look back to what it has become and what it's grown to, it's extraordinary. Mardi Gras is now an amazing expression of people doing sport, people who want to dress in leather, people who want to be fat and have beards, uh, um, you know, drag queens, the whole variety, it's on display. I mean, that has always existed, but it's never been on display like it is nowadays. You described it as amazing, so your both your feelings are quite positive of it today? Oh, yes, yes. I guess the only... Being an old-fashioned, political-minded person who thinks that lots can, lots more can be achieved, I find the commercial, commercial side of it a bit disappointing. I would still be happy if they were just ordinary trucks with the same kind of groups we have now, but it all seems needs to be terribly glamorous and it needs to be well, because it's glamorous, it needs to be sponsored. And, you know, I mean, it has a good side again as well. You know, to see A and Z Bank saying, you know, we support our employee. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. Again, I'm a bit in two minds about it. And these days, you've got the bus for the 78ers near the front of the parade. When you're on top of that bus, what's going through your mind when you can see all the crowd cheering you on? I, Bond goes on, on the bus, I still am strong enough to walk up Oxford Street and what I like to do and get a, an amazing sense of satisfaction out of is to 
just walk close to the spectators and touch their hands and, you know, see their smiling faces and some of them say, you know, wow, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, I find, I mean, the bus is wonderful because, you know, there are people who can't walk the distance, but I still like to, to walk. Although it's the other way, it's we now go up Oxford Street. <laughs> Briefly going back to that first Mardi Gras, you had a lot of people joining you as you went through Oxford Street coming out of the bars. But in general, was there much support from the existing gay press then and gays and lesbians? Or were a lot of people quite cynical of that first Mardi Gras? I, I, I'm not too... I don't know how I would measure that. All, all I do know is from the very early days that those premises in Oxford Street, the gay premises, I suppose there might have been one or two lesbians, but they were mainly for males along the street. Camp tried numerous occasions to get their support for issues or perhaps to get some resources or something. It was never forthcoming. So I don't know if that's a measure, if that's an answer to your question. But. What advice would you have for future Mardi Gras? Make it a bit simpler. Yeah. I mean, glamour attract, attracts people, obviously, and movement as well. Well, you can. Yeah. Many of those early protest parades were about gay liberation. In the Mardi Gras that we have now, it's very much about equality. And one of the issues is marriage equality. Do you feel a contradiction between that former message of liberation and equality, or can they work hand in hand? I, <clears throat> I think they can work hand in hand, really. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it, I mean, liberation is, is uh, it's all part of this sort of, I mean, you, we came out on national television in 1972, but you spend the rest of your life coming out. You have to do it every day. I've had to <clears throat> been at work and, and people say, did you have a nice weekend? And uh, I say, yes, we so-and-so. And, uh, but they never ask about Peter mm -hmm. and I. Uh, I always have to say, look, it, it, the two of us, you know, you, you and you and your husband and you and your wife uh, expect me mm -hmm. to acknowledge that and accept it. And I do, but uh, I would like you to do the same for me. I think liberation i think liberation was on about in a sense about equality i think it had a different label in those days i mean you know there was lobbying about having uh, a registration where same-sex couple could register this was in the 70s i've been part of putting that idea to the government I mean, we didn't call it marriage, but it was a form of being liberated from the oppression we were experiencing at the time. And there's still some of it about. And I suppose if we want to call it oppression, not having marriage equality is a form of oppression. It's an old fashioned word, we don't, you know. I mean, you've talked previously in interviews that you support the idea of marriage equality, even though you're quite happy, quote unquote, to live in sin. So when you see all these marriage equality people marching, are you quite positive about it? I feel all right about it, yes, because mm. I go from the basic principle that people should be able to have that option. Why, you know, why is that option denied to same-sex couples?